Hey everyone, today's episode is on the great mystic and stigmatist, Saint Lutgardas. She's a bit of an underrated saint, also a precursor for the Sacred Heart devotion, but also experienced the wounds of Christ, though in a different way than Saint Francis of Assisi. She was also the first woman to receive the stigmata and the second person to receive the stigmata. For more bonus episodes on St. Lutgardus, as well as all the saints that we've discussed and all the topics we've discussed, check out our Patreon. also comes with monthly gifts for some tiers and much more. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoy this episode on this incredible saint and her message of love. Enjoy. Lutgardus shot up in her bed when she heard the footsteps. It was a sound she only had heard a handful of times, yet it was a sound that brought her such delight, a sound that made her kneel and throw herself to the ground instantly whenever she heard it. One would imagine in a convent where dozens of nuns, housekeepers, and clergymen may be present, the sound of footsteps could be anyone, but no. Lutgardus was so intimate with this man, so close to him, that she even knew the sound of his feet. And of course, if she could hear the footsteps, it was only because he wanted her to hear the footsteps. For this was no man, but it was God incarnate. The footsteps were her beloved, Jesus Christ. And if we are to believe The tunic that a departed saint wore is a holy relic, and the entire ground in which Christ walks is consecrated, including the cold brick floor and tiles of Lutgardus' cell. Lutgardus knelt, awaiting to see him, and as she gazed at a particular square on the floor beneath her, two feet appeared, wounded ones, and from those wounds was the scent of roses. A scent she always longed for each time it left her presence. A scent that she would forever chase after. A sweet smell that she hoped remained forever in heaven. She heard him speak. Stand up, Lutgardus. And what she did, she looked at his face and he looked at hers. Knowing the uncertainty of his visits, she made sure to study his facial features so carefully, but even the way his jaw moved as he spoke, for the exact shade of his hair and beard were so ethereal that it was almost as if she couldn't grasp how he looked, even though he was standing right in front of her, as real as any person could be standing in front of her. You are still unhappy, my child, he said. Lutgardus began to feel shame. Shame that Jesus himself bestowed upon her gifts three times now. And each time, she felt it was too overwhelming or she felt she was gifted with things that she could not handle. I gave you gifts of the mind. I gave you gifts of the body. What else can I offer you, Lutgardus? What is it that you really desire? The next two words came forth from Luke Garda so unexpectedly, she was shocked, because it seemed as if her mind raced a thousand directions before replying, thinking of all the things she could get from our Lord, thinking what the root of what she desired was, her mind racing, her thoughts soaring, but two words only came forth, your heart. She wanted to cover her mouth in embarrassment because what does that mean? What did she even mean to want Jesus' heart? But instead of backtracking, instead of being ashamed, out of her mouth flowed forth more. I want your heart. I want to love like you, my Lord. But not just any love. I want to feel the love that you felt that led to you sacrificing yourself for the whole world. She paused, looking at the face of Christ, a face that maybe was too brilliant so her mind could never hang on to it. 
But the next thing she would always remember, for it was never shown in paintings or even mentioned in the Bible, but on Jesus' face was a smile. The Lord, the Savior of the world, then reached into his own side, and with a sound similar to a rock splashing into a puddle, Jesus reached his entire fist into the wound in his side, and with a cry, a grunt, a lament, he pulled his own heart right from his chest. With his other hand, he slid it into the side of Lutgardus, who fell in ecstasy, and before her eyes were two hearts, the vibrantly red heart of Christ and her own. The Lord then placed his own heart into the opening that he had created and took the heart of Lugardus for himself. Jesus consoled Lugardus as she was filled with such divine love as she was filled with joy, sorrow, and a glowing fire of godly passion. She fell to her knees kissing his feet and then she listened. She listened to those same footsteps, the steps that make such a familiar song that it could awake a sleeping saint. And she listened as they disappeared into the distance. This is another episode of St. Anthony's Tongue. And this is St. Lutgardus. Peace be with you and with your spirit. Welcome to another episode of St. Anthony's Tongue. I am your host, W. Today we will be discussing a very underrated saint. You could even call her an obscure saint. Though she was believed to have been the second saint to have received the stigmata. And as we'll discuss, it's a quite bit different than the stigmata of St. Francis. Also, as we'll discuss, and you may have already picked up on the symbolism, but her devotion to the heart of Christ is a early precursor to the devotion to the sacred heart, which would come a few centuries later. And I do intend on talking about St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, who gave us the Sacred Heart devotion as we know it today. We will be talking about her this season, as well as the Sacred Heart devotion in of itself. So I was kind of at a crossroads with this episode because I wanted to talk about the stigmata, but I also didn't want to ruin or spoil a Sacred Heart episode in the future. So I'll try to still incorporate some of that because this is still such a beautiful takeaway and you see this in the medieval church so this was in the 1200s you see this devotion to god's love already forming back then it's such a lovely thing and this has a lot to do with a devotion to the five wounds with a devotion to the five holy wounds you would often go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the Holy Land, and you would walk the places in which Christ was crucified. And a lot of political unrest, crusades, so on and so forth. So not everyone could take that pilgrimage. So people began to have the Stations of the Cross and other things, and they are all designated around the five holy wounds. And you start to see devotions come up for each of the wounds. You would have some or some groups, some cults, some organizations. I'm using cult, by the way, in the term of a group of people in a prayerful mode, not how it's used today. A lot of them may have a devotion to a particular wound. Uh, medieval Catholicism was very poetic and fascinating and weird like that. And one of those devotions was the side wound. And the side wound devotion 
flayed right into the heart of Christ and thus the love of Christ. So we start to see that with St. Luke Gardas. And I also just really enjoy that she was the second saint that we know of that got the stigmata and the first woman to have received the stigmata. So who is this wonderful saint? Let's jump in. So St. Lutgardus was born around 1182 and died in 1246. And those dates are important, and we'll get to that later. Lutgardus, by the way, is sometimes called Lutgard. I may accidentally go back and forth between those two pronunciations. But she is a Flemish saint from the Belgium area. And this is also notable because throughout church history, the Rhineland area, which includes Belgium, was known for the Rhineland mystics, and it was known for its mysticism. It was known for this hands-on yearning for God, seeing God in the flesh. Um, other Rhineland mystics, other Flemish or Flemish-adjacent mystics, um, Hildegard von Bingen, uh, Gertrude the Great, uh, Mechtilda. You also have a lot of men, too, but women mystics were the most popular and the most prominent in this area. But you have Meister Eckhart, um, Henry Suso, Nicholas of Cusa. So you have this history of mysticism in this area. And I would argue that mysticism, as in a direct experience with God, that actually was the main vehicle of Christianity up until 16th, 17th century. But regardless, this area was known for its mysticism. So Lutgardus would have been growing up during a time, the dates match, in which figures like Hildegard could have been an inspiration to her. And Lutgardus is a Benedictine. So like many children during this time, she was given to a convent as a dowry. And you may remember from other episodes I've done, like Hildegard, this has pretty common happened to St. Hildegard. But basically, many families would give one of their children to the church in order that they could be a monk or a nun as almost a, a form of tithe or a form of payment. And depending on the monastery or convent, some were only educated there um, or others, but probably many. It was kind of a given that they would remain in religious life, either as a religious or as a layperson, you know, living and assisting with the grounds. And this kind of forcing people to become monks and nuns, that did have an effect on church history throughout time, right? Because these these children were brought up in the church, not wanting to be in the church, not wanting to be a monk. And thus you start to have generations of very lax and lazy monks and nuns. And this is why you have every hundreds of years, you have another reform, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Bernard of Clairvaux before that. But I digress. Lutgardus did not really want to be a nun. She did not really have an interest in the religious life. She was a good student. She obeyed the abbess, but she would come and go from the monastery, and she would often take visitors, and that has quotations around it. Not sure the implications there, uh, but I can assume she was a chaste young woman, but she was known to fraternize with the local knights and noblemen. And of course, like all medieval saints and nuns, uh, very beautiful, uh, the most beautiful, right? It's, it's the, so common in hagiography, the most beautiful, the most intelligent. Uh, she had many male suitors, knights, noblemen, and they all were interested in marrying her. But around the age of 20, this would change because she received a vision of Christ showing her his wounds. And then she knew she did not want to marry. She did not want to live in the world. She did not only want, but needed to remain a nun. And around this time, she started to have more and more advances, more and more 
men wanting to marry her. And of course, I can only imagine in medieval hagiography, this would be, you know, the temptation of a demon or something. But that's really not in the story. But you almost expect that, right? The, the demons were, were tempting her to, to go with these men. You don't have that in the stories, but it would fit if you were to put it in that medieval framework. Anyhow, uh, there was a particular night that became very angry because all of a sudden she rejected his advances. So what he did was he abducted her into the woods to be alone. And then she, of course, fought and screamed and eventually threw such a fit that the townspeople could hear so he agreed to just take her back. But of course, the townspeople were waiting to hear what the screaming was about. And them two, a nun in a night, an attractive nun in a handsome night emerging from the woods, it created controversy. It created scandal. So of course, this damaged her reputation. Ludgardus, though, she saw this as a blessing because now she felt she had to remain in the monastery. She had to remain in the convent. I know I'm using convent and monastery interchangeably, but she had to remain in the Benedictine order because she was kind of socially shunned a little bit, or at least embarrassed. So when she had this vision, she had such great zeal, um, and a lot of the nuns kind of rolled their eyes. Her sisters rolled their eyes at her, thinking, oh yeah, we've all had you know, these consolation experiences too. We also have had the, these experiences with God at least once. It'll fade. So they kind of didn't believe her. They thought she was being young and naive. But over the next decade, she would receive even more visions, visions of Mary, Christ, St. John the Beloved. And that's kind of another interesting medieval hagiography. I keep saying hagiography. If you're unfamiliar with that term, it's essentially a study of a saint's life, uh, but usually in a slightly dramatized way. So you see St. John the Beloved a lot more in medieval saint stories, uh, such as St. Catherine of Siena, if you've listened to my series on her. But she had all of these visions, and her zeal for Christ never diminished, it only grew. However, during this time a movement started to spring forth, and it was a reform movement, as I kind of alluded to earlier. This reform movement was the Trappists, uh, also more commonly and more officially known as the Cistercians. We are going to talk about the Cistercians, aka the Trappist, a good bit. Two most famous, famous ones are Thomas Merton and St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, but this was a reform order that more strictly followed the rule of St. Benedict. So more serious about prayer, more serious about social life, so on and so forth, more strict fasting. And we have Lutgardus joining this order. And really interestingly, this was at the advice of another very weird, strange, mysterious saint, St. Christina the Astonishing, uh, I have an episode on her on Patreon. I might do something on the full podcast eventually for her. Really strange saint, passed away, flew out of her casket at the funeral, and then spent the rest of her life preaching and telling people to repent as she flew above the trees. Anyhow, that's an episode for another time. But Christina um, convinced Lutgardus to join the Cistercian Order. However, this meant that she would have to move to France, which was kind of the central hotbed for Cistercians. However, Lutgardus did not speak French or Latin. She only spoke Flemish, which meant that she would feel ostracized from the group. But it also meant that she could have more time in prayer and solitude. And then it was during this time that her fasting and prayer it became more intense. It's said, much like St. Catherine of Siena, that she survived only on the Eucharist for weeks at a time. And all of this while, she kept those visions. She kept that close relationship with Christ. He was still appearing to her. And the peak of her experience with Christ, it resulted in the sharing of the heart, which I dramatized at the top of the episode. 
But here's the story again from her biographer, Thomas of Canterbury. And these are his words. Her intimate familiarity with God is illustrated but by what might seem to some to be a presumptuous or cavalier attitude in expressing her likes and dislikes to him, which we shall now see. For it came to pass at this time that she was granted a certain power of healing in which her very touch had the effect of instantly curing the sicknesses of those who came to her. She perhaps thought it would be helpful and it would lead her souls to Jesus. Yet it seemingly became a great distraction for her and her fellow nuns. Understandably, she soon found herself beginning to be very busy with those who appealed to her to cure them of their minor ailments. She complained to God of this, assuring him that it interfered with her and the other's prayer life. Why did you go and give me such a great grace, Lord? Now I hardly have any time to be alone with you. Take it away, please. And she added artlessly, Only give me another grace. Give me something better. What grace do you want me to give you? In its place, Jesus asked. Ludgard, being a choir nun, thought it would be very appropriate if she were to be given a miraculous understanding of Latin in order that she might have more devotion in reciting the Psalms. As matters stood, she did not understand a word of what she said in choir, although she prayed with great fervor. The grace granted, she discovered to her surprise that once again, it did not have the results she expected. She began to receive many vivid intellectual lights at the office and have numerous intuitions regarding the Psalms and their meanings. But somehow, all this new knowledge left her feeling dry and empty in her heart. God had granted her this last relatively useless favor together with enough light to see that it was not what she needed. And she soon turned to him once more, confessing that all these lofty intuitions only interfered with her devotion instead of nourishing it. So seizing the moment, Jesus asked her, what then do you want? This time, Jesus had led her secretly to the discovery of the right answer. Lord, she told him, I want thy heart. You want my heart, said Jesus. Well, I too want your heart. Ludgard replied, take it, dear Lord, but take it in such a way that the love of your heart may be so mingled and united with my own heart that I may possess my heart in thee and that it may always remain there secure in your protection. So you have Lutgard almost being, as her biographer said, cavalier, I would say bratty in the fact that Christ, God, has given her all these gifts, but they were never enough. She always wanted more, and eventually she got what she needed. And it wasn't so much that she always wanted more. It was that what she was given felt dry. And you're probably already seeing the symbolism with the heart versus the mind, but we'll get to that in a moment. This, of course, is going to be about the stigmata of St. Lutgardas. So let's talk about that first really quickly. So upon receiving the heart of Christ, she was able to perform miracles and became known as this great wonder worker. She especially had the power of intercessory prayer because now she had Christ's heart within her. It was as if any prayer that she said with love and devotion, it would come true. And she did have the side wound due to this interaction of the hearts being traded. So it counts as a stigmata, but she would also receive the stigmata in the same vein that we know it today with the bleeding palms and feet. So this makes her the second person to receive the stigmata, as well as the first woman. And as I mentioned, this is kind of the precursor to the Sacred Heart devotion. But the biggest fruit from the story is right there in the heart exchange. She could have anything she wanted. She could have been fluent in Latin. She had the ability to understand all of Scripture, all of Psalms. And also, understanding Latin and speaking Latin meant she could now communicate with her sisters because most religious orders spoke Latin, but she didn't choose that either. And eventually, when she would get these things, she saw and felt that they were empty. I can speak on all the meanings of the Psalms, but it's empty. 
I can heal people very quickly, but it's empty. Because she wanted love. And that, my friends, my dear lovers of God, is really the largest takeaway. And we still see that so often in the church today. Apologetics are important. Defending the faith (laughs) is important. But it's not more important than love. Who are we that we can go and list all of the ins and outs of canon law, the ins and outs of the various heresies, but we cannot love like Christ. As I've said time and time again on social media, on podcasts, God most likely is not going to give you a theology test in order for you to enter the gates of heaven. Rather, you are going to be judged on your fruits and how you loved like Christ. How much of Christ's heart did you have in your own? And this is something that we see in the Cistercian order during this time. Bernard was very suspicious of scholasticism, which would become the leading form of thought with St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Dominic, and so so forth. But he felt that this religion of the mind would get us away from the experience of the heart. And the point is never been believing in the right things, but we surely make it that way. So I would argue, alongside Lutgardus and her spiritual grandfather, Bernard of Clairvaux, the most important thing is to love like Christ, become a living icon of his love. So sure, one should dedicate themselves to learning the dogmas, learn the doctrines, learn the meanings of the Psalms. That's part of meditation. That's part of contemplation but we cannot let our faith be defined by the intellect. Rather, we must let it be defined by how deeply our hearts are mirroring the sacred heart of Christ. So when we face the crossroads of the fruit of knowledge versus the fruit of God's love, which one should we choose? Lutgardus chose love, and I hope that I would too and you as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief rundown of Lutgardus, an incredible saint, an incredible mystic. There are some more writings out there on her life. You also have her as the patron of the blind, the patron of disabled people. I would also go and say she could be a patron of those with heart-related illnesses. But all in all, I think she is a patron that can assist us in loving like Christ loved. So let's end this with a prayer, as we always do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear Father, you have bestowed upon us the great saints so that we may emulate their lives, for they emulated the life of Christ. Thank you for St. Lutgardus, who reminds us to love who reminds us to go beyond the intellect, beyond the mind, and more deeply into the heart. Like her, allow us to possess a love like Christ, not only a love for what is good, not only a love that is filled with joy, but a love that is filled with passion, a love that is filled with fire that leads us to change, and a love and a heart is so bright that it illuminates even the darkest of our hells. St. Lutgardus, pray for us. Thank you for listening to this episode of St. Anthony's Tongue. Tune in next week as we continue our series on the stigmatists with the great St. Gemma Galgani. God bless you. Hey everyone, today's episode is on the great mystic 